I'm Scott Lucas. This is World Unfiltered. The word populism is in a lot of media these days. It's been thrown around with respect to what's been happening in America, that fellow Donald Trump. It's been used with respect to areas like Turkey and the question about President Erdogan and his approach to government there. But of course, it's been applied to Europe. In fact, it's been applied to Europe so often, I've gotten a bit confused. Is the populism we talk about the populism of some parties that have emerged to take power, right-wing parties, as in Hungary and in Poland? Is it a left-wing populism, which adheres to principles of socialism, uh, such as, for example, a movement called Five Star, which I think once was prominent in Italy? Or is populism now associated with individual politicians and even personalities? Think about Vladimir Zelensky in Ukraine. In other words, can we have a single broad brush approach to populism, or do we have to go a little bit deeper on a case-by-case -case basis? And that brings me to Italy. Italy has had a change in government with one technocrat, Giuseppe Conte, being replaced by another, Mario Draghi, the former head of the European Central Bank. But it also has two populist parties, one which is apparently thinking of joining the government, the League of Matteo Salvini, and one which is resolved to stay outside the government, the Brothers of Italy, of Georgia Maloney. How do we begin to unpack all of that? Well, as usual, I go to someone who knows a lot more than I do. And in this case, I've got someone who knows both about populism and Italy. Uh, Dr. Daniele Arbitazzi, reader in politics at the University of Birmingham. He's the director of the ESRC funded Populism in Action Project, uh, a project which is studying populism, right wing populism in four different countries, from Finland to Switzerland, to Belgium, to Italy. He's also the co-editor with David Vampa of a new book which has come out with Routledge, which I highly recommend to you, which is Populism and Political Competition in Western Europe. And as I said, he's one of the smartest guys around when it comes to unpacking Italian politics. Daniele, thanks for coming to help me out on World Unfiltered. Thank you for inviting me, Scott. It's a great pleasure to be here. Okay, I'm gonna start with the rookie question. You get it all the time, I know, when you go off and you do your, your webinars and when you're chatting with folks, and I'm going to start off with my assumption. So tell me, is populism the starting point that it is an anti-elite? It's an anti-business elite or anti-political elite or anti-cultural elite. And if that's the case, how is right-wing populism being anti-elite different from left-wing populism, which could be anti-elite? Oh, that's, uh, that's actually a good question. I mean, is populism essentially being anti-elite? I would say... Um, it is a fundamental ingredient of populism. Uh, it is not enough uh, to fully define what populism is, but uh, it is an essential ingredient, meaning that um, populists uh, always rally against what they posit uh, or argue is a, a, an elite which they argue is the uh, uh, embodiment of all evil. There is really kind of a moral dimension here, which is very important. The elites are not, not just uh, opponents or, or people like in the case of Marxists, or people who just are uh, looking after their own interests, but uh, they, they are evil, they, they, they are bad, they are corrupted, and uh, they always want to take away from the people what belongs to them. Now, the other ingredient of populism, which is essential, is the idea that the people itself is uh, united and homogenous and that you can detect some kind of common will of the people. So that there is a will of the people that can be represented, obviously, by the populist leader or party. Uh, so this is another essential ingredient. These things can apply uh, to both parties and leaders that subscribe to right-wing ideas and values and those who subscribe to left-wing ideas and values. Because populism in itself is never or very rarely enough to define parties and leaders. It doesn't say many things and it tends to uh, walk alongside other ideologies. So you usually find uh, populists that are also socialists, populists that subscribe to nativism and authoritarianism, like the populist radical right variety, which is uh, very common in Europe. Um, very rarely you find populists that are simply populists. Um, arguably one case could be the one that you mentioned at the beginning, five star, 
at least five star as we knew it because five star is changing very rapidly right now. Um, so why then do we uh, distinguish between within these two right wing and left wing populism? But the, both of them uh, focus on, on the elites uh, and, and argue that there is an elite that is taking away from the people what belongs to them. Uh, left wing populists tend to focus more uh, on the on the financial and economic elites. Uh, right wing populists are more interested also in the cultural elites. Uh, but but this distinction is not an absolute distinction. It's just a in general, uh, this tends to work. But what is really important is the fact that uh, when you look at uh, right-wing populists, uh, they are exclusionary, meaning that they, they posit the existence of these people, but they also spend a lot of time telling us who does not belong to the people. And very often these groups or individuals that are said not to belong to the people are said to be manipulated by these elites, uh, these corrupt elites. Uh, that want to take away from the people what belongs to them. So an obvious uh, argument could be uh, uh, the infamous Soros, who is always uh, very much mentioned by uh, certain parties, uh, is using migrants to take away from us our identity. So this would be a kind of classic argument. Left-wing populists uh, tend to be inclusive. So uh, they want to speak on behalf of the 99%, uh, and, and they they obviously exclude somebody from the people, that's the elite. By definition, the elite is not part of the people, it's the ones that are exploiting the people. But apart from that, tend to have also policies that tend to uh, favor then the, the, the material advancement and of what they might uh, define as working class or maybe the poor or the people at the bottom. I mean, the, the way you talk about them is different according to the context. But so they really target the elites and, and um, they, they tend to, to, to try and create more inclusion in the communities in this sense. Okay, that's a really helpful starting point for me. Let me go straight in on the Italian case, uh, which of course has come back into the news with the change in government recently. As I mentioned, on the surface, it's a change from one technocratic led government uh, to another government led by a technocrat, but there's various political parties that are scrambling to either be part of the coalition or to stand against it. I, my starting point before we get to populism simply is, is this a case of a response to issues that have shifted in Italy, whether it be general issues, economic issues, the issue of immigration? Is it a response to the specific issue of the handling of the coronavirus pandemic? Or is this merely a shuffling of deck chairs of power, which really has no specific issue, it's just people deciding whether or not they want to be in on the game, as it were, of governing. Yeah, well, um, it's quite a job to try and, and now explain this in one minute, but I, I'll try to be very, very fast. So th there is a long tradition of technocratic governments in Italy, starting with what uh, uh, experts in Italian politics often call the Second Republic, which is from the beginning of the 1990s onwards, so about 30 years ago. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and due to other complicated factors. In this period, the traditional parties that have governed Italy for 50 years collapse, mainly first and foremost, uh, Christian democracy and the Socialist Party. And you have new parties uh, becoming dominant, first and foremost, uh, Berlusconi's Forza Italia, which becomes the fulcrum of the political spectrum for 25 years or something. So uh, in the following years, uh, what you get is Sometimes a competition between center right and center left, which is uh, actually not uncommon in Europe. Sometimes in moments of crisis, political parties stepping back and letting somebody who's kind of external or, or supposed to be external or from politics to take over. Uh, the first technocratic government is in 1993. Drag is the last and is the fourth. So <laughs> we're talking about 30 years, we're already at four. So what happens is that, uh, and this is also due to the kind of very uh, embedded culture of suspicion towards, towards the political class, which is not without reason. What happens is that in moments of crisis, uh, political parties step back and let somebody who is very often a banker or from the world of banking, or indeed in the case of Mario Monti, somebody what had uh, an important job in the uh, in the EU to to take over, and he or she 
so far has always been a hit, uh, has got international reputation, is well regarded, so he can uh, often do things that others will find it difficult. That's an example of Mario Monti 10 years ago, who imposed austerity. The technocratic governments can come in many forms. Some of them are 100% technocratic, some of them, like the last one, Draghi, is, is a technocrat who is actually leading a number of ministers, the majority of whom are actually from political parties. So they can come in many forms, but the message is sent is often the same, which is uh, the political class can't resolve this. So they are stepping back and they are asking for help. And the media then tend to kind of portray these people as kind of saviors who come in until it's, it's the time to, to, to start throwing stones at them. So uh, why did this happen now? Well, obviously because uh, of the coronavirus crisis and uh, that's a very important addition, the fact that this time there are a huge amount of money coming to Italy through the recovery fund. And this money needs to be allocated. The EU needs to have a little bit of confidence in how it is being allocated. And everybody hopes, including myself, is also spent well. Uh, and, and it has uh, an impact on how the, the economy then it, it restarts. So uh, when uh, the Conte government was uh, uh, taken down by Matteo Renzi's Italia Viva, the president has appointed somebody that he felt uh, could uh, attract huge support because the job of the president is to try not to dissolve parliament if uh, alternative majorities can be found. That's what he did. So he picked a name that had already been in, in the newspapers for at least two years, people talking about whether Draghi you now could uh, be, become a, a prime minister. And everything has happened again, as it's had happened in, in the last 30 years more than once. So. The parties have rallied uh, uh, behind him. One very good reason is, is what I already mentioned, because they want to be in the room when uh, the proposals are sent to, to the EU for how to allocate the funds. So they want to be present. They want to have a voice in, in what kind of proposals should be defined and should be put on the table. So th this all, all makes uh, a lot of sense. But of course, uh, there are also then uh, effects of all this on, on the political system, party systems, and what people think of their political parties. And maybe one day we, we can explore in, in more length. Well, let me start with just a quick exploration in the sense of why is it that one right wing populist party, Matteo Salvini's Liga, decides it wants to be in the room where it happens, so to speak, uh, joining the elite? Whereas another rising right-wing populist party, uh, Georgia Maloney and Brothers of Italy, say they don't want to be in the room. What, what, why have these two populist parties, not even almost in a sense diverge from each other, but set up a competition between themselves? So the League and the Brothers of Italy are, uh, are really like brothers in the sense that they, they, they are condemned to live in the same house and, and they actually need each other, but they also hate each other as, as it happens with your uh, siblings in the sense that uh, um, the center right, which we can now call really right because uh, these parties are quite radical. Mm -hmm. uh, as a coalition, as a coalition of three parties, these two that you mentioned of and Berlusconi Forza Italia, uh, this has existed now for decades and uh, we can be pretty sure they're gonna fight the next election in 2023 as allies because they want to govern and they need each other to get above the 50% line and govern. However, um, both the League and Brothers of Italy are, are both populist radical right parties, so not just populist, but also uh, authoritarian and, and uh, nativists. So they, they, to an extent, compete uh, on very similar issues. Uh, geographically, the, the League is very well rooted in the North, uh, Brothers of Italy more in the center and the south, but if you look at the proposals, again, Brazil or Italy is, is more interested in investing in the welfare state. The league is a more kind, kind of tax cutting party, but many other things are very similar. So by all means, we can say that they are trying to attract the same voters. Uh, they, they need to, to steal votes from each other. And very importantly, very importantly, whoever it ends up as the largest at the next election will choose the prime minister if, if their side wins the election. If, if the right wins the election, not the left or whatever they come up with, uh, could be probably left plus the five-star movement, 
if the right wins as a coalition, if Brazil has got one more vote than the league, Meloni has every right to say, I'm the prime minister, because this was the agreement in the past. And it makes sense. So uh, every vote stolen from the league is worth double for Brazil, so literally, and vice versa. So they need to compete. Now, um, Brothers of Italy has decided early on, quite correctly, I think, from their perspective, that it was worth being the only opposition to the Draghi's government in the next two years, because they are this. There is no other proper party, organized party, that is opposing this government. There are some individual MPs. This is not a party. They, they, they don't have, a, obviously, the structures and the organization of a party. So they are the only ones they will get, and they are getting plenty of uh, uh, airtime on television because they are the only official opposition. So this is what the rules say. Uh, they will chair important uh, committees in parliament. They will have plenty of, of opportunities to make their case. And you can clearly expect that their, their support will increase because uh, even when Draghi starts distributing the goodies, he, he won't be able to give given to everybody, so there will inevitably be people who feel they've been left out and they, they deserved something or maybe they, they deserved more. So it's a very good place where to be when you are the only opposition. Oh, why did the league get, uh, got in? Uh, personally, I think it was a mistake, but but the reason why they, they, they went in is because uh, the league is very, very strong in, in Northern Italy in areas of diffused industrialization, uh, which uh, this is the economic powerhouse of Italy. And it was very clear, was very clear that uh, uh, there were plenty of league uh, mayors, uh, regional governors and, and, and MPs from these areas that wanted the league to be in the room to make sure that uh, some of this money, and it's a lot of money, uh, we're talking about 200 billion euros, goes to the north to either he's investing in infrastructure, but anyway, it's, it's there to, to kind of kickstart the economy which has suffered for 30 years for a number of complicated reasons. So there was a very strong argument for going in. Now, how is Salvini going to manage the situation? Uh, we'll see. I think he'll manage it by trying to keep one foot in and one foot out of government. Uh, but uh, objectively, in terms of just electoral support, we can argue that uh, Brothers of Italy probably made the right choice. And in fact, they are on the way up. But Salvini will be able to use a different argument. So I was there and, and I made sure that some of this money went to this, went to that. We'll see. We'll see whether this argument can allow him to then bounce back. Uh, but as I said, they chose a different strategy for these reasons. But is the immediate lesson from the Italian case, and I mean immediate, I'm not sure if we can go a year, two years down the line, the immediate lesson that populism hits the wall when it hits the wallet or the checkbook? In other words, when there's money on the table to be had, the populist principles get set aside? Well, I, I now look at these parties, populist parties in Europe as, as kind of ordinary parties. Um, I don't like all this language of, uh, which is very common in the media, talk about them like extraordinary, maverick, outsiders, challengers. Many of them have been in governments many times. Many of them are, very aware that they need to compromise, they need to uh, come up with strategies according to what's going on. In this case, we have had a kind of the, the most uh, destructive crisis, I think, uh, I don't know since when, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I, obviously, it's, it's kind of wiped out um, huge amounts of money and, and industries and companies. So it, it, we, are, we are in uncharted territory. Uh, the idea that populists will be kind of pure and just stick to their principles and never compromise it, it is, I think, it is, it's proven wrong by, by decades now of, of uh, contemporary European history, in which we have seen populists getting into government, compromising. The thing is, pop, um, parties like the League usually don't compromise on the issues that they really matter for their uh, followers. So, for instance, immigration. Um, I think that when, when the spring comes and we start seeing uh, again uh, sh ships or boats uh, carrying people from Northern Africa into uh, Lampedusa, so into Italian territory, 
Salvini will 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 restart like before and 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 we will we, we, we'll focus on the issue just like he has done in the past. Certain issues uh, are issues that they tend to, to talk about, especially when they have to do with identity. So migration, Islam for, for European populists. Um, but on issues such as, for instance, uh, the economy or also the welfare state, they, they have compromised uh, all around Europe. Uh, so uh, are these parties unable to, to understand it? You know, the tactic and the strategy need to be adapted to the context? No, I, th I think some of them are actually very good at doing this. As I said, Salvini, perceived, uh, I think, to be honest, he was forced, a lot of observers think that he was really forced by others within the party to just, you know, get into the room, that's it. Uh, and he knows that in electoral terms, there may be a price to pay, but on the other hand, as I said, maybe, we'll see, maybe he will have a good argument about uh, being able to, to be there when the money is allocated. Uh, is this going to impact on our populist society the borders of Italy? I don't think so. I, I don't think it does. Um, I, I think that you know what is uh, um, driving still the success of populism uh, is, is the fact that there is a real detachment between political elites and people. Uh, this is true. <laughs> I mean, they are not making it up. Um, uh, there, there is really, I mean, if you look at, for instance, left-wing populists, uh, they started grow, growing after the financial crash and years of austerity. I mean, there was really a situation in which the 1% the was getting richer and the 99% was getting squeezed, particularly the 30% or the 99%, which is at the very bottom. So, I mean, it's not that they always make up things. I mean, very often they, they, they start from, from things that are happening. They just, you may disagree with how they interpret them. Uh, and equally, I mean, when you look at right-wing populists, I mean, it's quite obvious that issues having to do with migration or religion can be activated. I mean, how important they really are, well, it also depends how you frame them, how you talk about them. I remember being called not very long ago, uh, just uh, the day after Christmas, well, I think it might have been two years ago, but by a radio station here in the UK to comment on, on one dinghy crossing the channel which they, the journalists defined as the beginning of a crisis. And I said, uh, uh, if for you, one dinghy with four people on board is the beginning of a crisis, then obviously, that, that, you know, how you frame it, how you discuss it, I, that's also very important. But these things are here to stay. These are here to stay. And if we have some other organization, such as we have had, obviously, Islamic State recently, that restarts with attacks on Europe, then all of these things will, will just... Uh, uh, come up again uh, just uh, as much as, as they were discussed before. Okay, Daniele, from the Italian case, and you're the head of a project which is looking at right-wing populism across Europe, is there a single way or a single thread that we can link right-wing populism now? I mean, is it through positioning versus elites? Is it positioning on immigration? I mean, can we connect, say, the Italian parties with the parties in government in Hungary and Poland, even with the Finns party in Finland? Is that what holds it together? Or do we actually have to say now that when you go to populism, you have to just go on a case by case basis wherever you're moving across Europe? Well, when, when you're looking at the policies, uh, they will not necessarily always uh, be the same because uh, they nationalism and nativism, nativisms of populist radical right parties is even more important than the populism. Populism is one of the ingredients of their uh, identity, but it's, it's not the end of the story. As I mentioned at the beginning, by the way, populism says very little, so it's very rarely the only ideology that the party can hold on to. Uh, so if, we're, if we are talking about populist radical right, not, not uh, for instance, the left-wing populists, uh, then, um, for instance, it's quite obvious that sometimes they will they will have different interests because, I mean, if uh, Salvini in Italy says that Europe needs to take many more migrants and asylum seekers because they are all coming to Italy, in the Freedom Party in Austria or the Finns Party in Finland, or, or indeed, of course, Fidesz in Hungary was saying, I don't think so, <laughs> that we have a Dublin. Uh, a treaty which says that if they land in Italy, you deal with their applications for asylum, my friend. So that's clearly the case. Or you can see uh, at the time of the Greek crisis, so you would have Finland 
the Finns party criticizing the bailout of Greece, uh, indeed the Freedom Party in Austria. So they will say in Northern Europe, they will say, oh, these lazy Greeks, Italians, Spaniards, Portuguese, what, whatever it might be, um, why should we invest money to, to, to rat them out? And this might be the same parties that then they, they, they take part in, in a meeting uh, talking about migration in Europe, but seems to be all friendly with each other. But when it comes to these issues, I have different agendas. So they are not going to agree on certain issues. That's also one reason why they've never really all been in the same group in the European Parliament. They're always spread across different groups. But um, although the, the, the proposals are tuned to that context, you can see a thread connecting them. As I said, if we're talking about the populist radical right, which is the most common in Europe, most uh, the stronger at the moment. So there is a thread connecting them, which is uh, um, nativism, which is basically uh, the argument that uh, anybody from outside the national community is a threat. Um, authoritarianism in terms of proposals, law and order. Uh, this is the two things are often connected. So law and order very often means targeting, for instance, Muslim communities. Um, so I'm not just in favor of, of, of uh, tougher legislation. I'm also in favor of targeting those people over there who are a threat because of their religion. So these things are, are clearly connected, right? So, and they all, always go hand in hand. Then who the enemy is depends on the context. I mean, in certain uh, parts of Central and Eastern Europe, internal minorities within a nation state uh, can be posited as being uh, a threat, um, maybe even more than foreigners or people coming from outside. So who is, who is the enemy can change, but there is this idea of, as I said, nativism, authoritarianism, and then the populism, which is an ingredient, it's not the only ingredient. And, and again, this is also linked to the rest because you can argue that the national elites and indeed the supranational elites like the EU are conniving and coming together to bring in more cheap labor from Africa. And this is gonna destroy the identity of the nation. It's also this going to destroy the opportunities of working class people to get a job which is paid well. And it's all done in the interest of capital. You see how you can connect all these things. So the populism with the nativism. So and then the authoritarianism comes in and say, wow, these people are also dangerous. They don't just take jobs, they're also dangerous. They, they assault people, they rape women or, or whatever it might be. So it's all connected and you can uh, provide a different uh, narrative depending on the context you find yourself in. And I give you a final example. For instance, the EU, there's often mentioned in, in the media, so the main enemy of, of certain parties. Because people start from the case of the UK and just assume that this could have had a domino effect. In reality, for many parties, and there are also plenty of publications now on this, for many populist radical right parties in Europe, the EU is not and has never been uh, the major theme or even, or even a big theme. Uh, there are many more, more important themes and, and they already have a national elites they can focus on, by the way. So yes, they will bring in the EU, but they can also change uh, strategy on the EU. Uh, and and uh, Marine Le Pen has done so. At some point, it seemed that she was almost talking about coming out of the Euro, then she's uh, changed completely. And, and of course, uh, the most obvious example is Salvini again, but because for the league, the EU is not a major issue. And, and anyway, at the end of the day, they represent the most productive parts of Northern Italy. They will never dream even in a million years of coming out of the Euro. But it's good during campaigns and it's good if you put it on a t-shirt. Okay, we have some elements of rhetoric then that we could talk about without actually coming out of the EU. But you've talked about this threat of nativism, which we could see magnified if we have another surge in refugees, for example. Let me ask about a counter threat that was brought to me by one of your research fellows in the Populism in Action Project, Adrian Favero, who looked at the case of Switzerland and I think, if I understand right, just simply said that one of the reasons why, as it were, the populists have not triumphed in Switzerland is because the parties who are in the ruling coalition have succeeded with valence issues. 
In other words, basic issues where you need to show competence on an issue of concern. It could be climate change. It could be dealing with coronavirus. It could be simply dealing with economic and social provision. Is it the case that one of the biggest checks on populism is simply that those governments who are, quote, not populist, whether they're center, center right, center left, actually show an ability to deal with the current crisis, the economic, social, and health effects of coronavirus? Could that hold back populism for the foreseeable future? Well, uh, I'm not sure Switzerland is actually a good example because the biggest party in Switzerland is the Swiss People's Party, and it's, it is in government because they have a system whereby all the large parties uh, have to stay in government. I mean, it's, it's a consociational system. It's very different from the British one or even the Italian one. So uh, in that case, uh, yes, I mean, as you mentioned, you, you witnessed for a short period uh, a year ago, the Swiss People's Party kind of toning down its uh, rhetoric because there was a period in which people really seemed to want some, some kind of sense of unity from the, the ruling elites. Um, now, uh, are governments able to respond to the needs of people? I think uh, the, the, one of the interesting uh, things that were actually underlined by Peter Mayer, an important scholar that unfortunately is not with us anymore, was this idea that um, non-populist parties in, uh, very often use a language of responsibility, whereby they are spending a lot of time telling us why they can't do anything about X. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, uh, immigration, ah, yeah, but, but we are in the uh, European Union, therefore, yeah, let's not waste time talking about that. It's, it's freedom of movement, okay? Um, the, the conditions of, of, of people with, with precarious contracts, right? Temporary contracts. Yeah, but we need flexibility in the economy. We are part of a, a world system nowadays. If we don't compete well, then our industry will crash. So we can't do it. So what I mean is now, regardless of who's right or wrong, we, we, can, we can look at each specific issue and probably we won't agree on everything, but we can discuss it. But the language of not, not being able to address anything it's a quite common language in recent years due to a sort of reasons. I mean, in part, national governments have very limited powers. That's true because you are part, for instance, of the European Union in which some powers have been devolved at a, at a different level. So, or if you, if you use the same currency or other 20 something countries, then of course the, the, that comes with a price in terms of, of you know, setting your monetary policy, for instance. So, I'm not saying all of this is made up, but what I'm saying is that what you get uh, is a lot of talk about what can't be done. And populists instead, they, they talk about what can be done. Uh, and in, in part, there are things that can be done if you have the political will, and in part, I think they cannot be done and they posit as, as being doable and they are not doable. But um, what I mean is that they, 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 they portray themselves as being responsive. And uh, I think it's fair enough that politics also needs to be responsive. You cannot just play the part of being responsible. People do expect politics to be responsive, especially in times of crisis. Uh, and frankly, I haven't seen an awful lot of that from uh, more traditional center-right and center-left parties. Certainly in Italy, one of the huge problems with, with uh, Italy is precisely that the center-left never knows what to do, has no proposals, no identity, and, it, it never says something like, uh, yeah, this has to be addressed, can be addressed, this is the way we will address it, and we're going to be bold about it. So it's always about, ah, oh, no, we cannot do it, ah, oh, no. So it's kind of managing the, what's going on, more or less in a way that, you know, you stop everybody from crashing down, but that's not enough. For the big finish, in terms of competence, can the European Union contain populism, as arguably it has, at least for the moment in Italy, or will populism undermine the European Union? I think this uh, recovery fund is, uh, well, uh, this is a, if you want to, it's quite obvious things to say, but I think it's true. It's quite a turning point because uh, it would have been unthinkable only 10 years ago. Uh, the fact that we reached this agreement uh, I think uh, can give non-populist parties uh, a lot of ammunitions now to say, uh, 
particularly parties that are just not, not just non-populist, but also they want to kind of push back against extreme nationalism and nativism. So let's say the, the opponents of specifically of the populist radical right, specifically the populist right, they, they, they can, give, can give them some ammunition to say, if we work together, uh, if we use our institutions uh, in a clever manner, something good can also come out of it. But of course, people haven't seen this morning yet. They certainly haven't seen the impact of this morning. So we are talking about, um, now, sometime before anybody will, will see an effect. But I think, I mean, the, the fact that it was set up, the fact that it's coming has completely changed the debate in Italy. Now, is this going to be the end of populism in Italy or in Europe? Absolutely not. Not even in Italy, because uh, the League uh, will, will go back to its uh, previous identity before too long. I have no doubts about that. Um, but, you know, obviously, when institutions work, uh, then parties like this, uh, I have um, fewer arguments. There's no doubt about that. Well, ironically, you and I discussed that in a Brexit Britain, which will not see a penny of that recovery fund. But maybe that's another topic for us to discuss at another time. For now, Daniele Obertazzi, thank you very much for that walkthrough, both specifically on Italy and then generally on populism. I have a feeling I may be coming back to you for further guidance as the situation develops, as it were. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Scott. Pleasure to be here. Such a pleasure. And let me also give thanks to the great folks at Deep Dive Politics who kept us on air, including despite the fact I had drilling going on in the building next to me. And thanks to you viewers for your patience while that drilling was going on and hopefully learning alongside me uh, over this past half hour. For now, however, let me ask you to check us out on Twitter at dive underscore politics. We're on Facebook at Deep Dive Politics. Uh, all of the videos, not just this one, but all of the World Unfiltered are on YouTube. And if you prefer the audio version when you're jogging or going to work, we're on Spotify as well. And finally, last but not least, stay safe, stay sane, be decent to each other. I'm Scott Lucas. This has been World Unfiltered.